Thanks, guys. <sighs> what fun stuff. You know, and if only that's all our Bible told us. You know, that Jesus loves us. And how to live from that place. And, you know, we've all been told that the Bible tells us a whole lot of other stuff, too. I've had uh, an interesting relationship with the Bible over the years. I grew up in the Baptist church, and uh, it was a scary book. It was, it was pretty scary. And a long time later, actually about 10 years ago, um, I'd been in unity for a while. And um, if you remember, the, uh, the war was going pretty hot and heavy back then. And the unit that I was with was getting ready to deploy over into the sandbox. I was at my armory in Plant City, Florida, and um, <laughs> it's actually in the latrine. And um, a colonel, you know, kind of sidles up to the next, uh, the next stall there. I looked over at him, he had a cross on. Well, I recognized him. He was a chaplain from the state headquarters. And I'd met him um, because I used to spend a lot of time with my battalion chaplain from uh, my previous unit. He had uh, he'd counseled me a lot at a time in my life when I really needed it. And subsequently, we'd become pretty good friends. So I knew this, I knew this colonel. I was like, Colonel, what are you doing here? And he said, well, we've got to decide who's going to go overseas with you guys. And I said, hey, is Father Cecil going to come with us? He's like, nah. You know, he said, I can't deploy Father Cecil. He's... Uh, one of the two chaplains that I, one of the two chaplains that I have, he's one of the two chaplains that I, he's one of the two chaplains that I have who is uh, employable but not deployable. And he went on to tell me that um, while he had slots in the state for about 22 different chaplains, he only had nine chaplains, and um, the, next, the following year, seven of those were going to be deployed. So he'd only have two chaplains to cover the entire state of Florida. Now, at that point, um, we were in a we were going to be deployed in a non-standard mission, which means that I was not going to be doing the job that the Army had at that point trained me for about 20 years to do. And I was about two and a half, three years into recovery, and my faith had become extremely important to me. And I, I thought to myself, well, you know, I could probably be a chaplain. And so I began to take my first steps down the path towards ministry. That was actually what got me started, was that chance conversation with that chaplain in the latrine at the Plant City Armory. So the first thing I was going to do was, you know, go through the, the steps that you need to go through to become an Army chaplain. And one of the things you need is a Master's in Divinity degree. Now, at the time, I was also a single parent with primary custody of two teenage girls. So I didn't just want to, you know, pull up stakes and go off to, uh, to seminary. And I began looking around online. And I found Liberty University, which, as some of you may know, uh, is the school that was founded by Jerry Falwell and is uh, somewhat conservative. But I thought, you know what, it's just, you know, you take the classes online, you learn the stuff, you take a test, you move on, it's okay, you know, it's not going to be that tough. I can do that. And so I, you know, applied and did all the things that you have to do, and I signed up for my first couple classes. And the first one was going to be history of the Bible. And I love history, as some of you have may, may have figured out by now from some of the stories I tell. And I thought, well, that'll be easy. I'll, I'll enjoy that. So we started off with Genesis. Now, I'm, I'm watching these DVDs, and the way they were produced is there was the instructor teaching, and then they would periodically cut to the class that, that, he, was, uh, that he had with him. 
and they're fairly recent. I mean, this was, this was in 2005. The, the DVDs look like they'd been produced, you know, at least around 2000, so pretty recent stuff. But it was, it was rough going for me. I had to swallow a lot and, you know, kind of winced at several things, but I was, I was getting there. You know, and they were obviously, you know, in, in Genesis taking the creation story very literally, which I just, I kind of expected. I was like, okay, I, 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 can, I can deal with that. Then we got to the great flood. <clears throat> now, so here, here's this guy, and God bless him. He looked like he had just stepped out of the 1950s. And he's up in front of this class, who all look, you know, like kids from around 2000. And he's, he's talking about, you know, the, kind of the setup for the great flood. And he says, okay, and now remember, this is important, until the great flood, it had never rained on the earth. Water just oozed up out of the ground. And then they cut to the class and everybody's like, <laughs> I took my remote and went click. And that, that's it. I can't take it. I can't do it. And I said aloud to myself, and this is the first time I said it, when I become a minister, I'm going to be a unity minister. And shortly after that, I started taking the SEE classes necessary to become a unity minister. And here I am today in Birmingham, Alabama, <laughs> on the buckle of the Bible belt. Um, with a lot of folks who believed exactly the way those folks that I, you know, kind of ran screaming from a couple of times. So, one thing that has become very clear for me on my path is that I need a relationship with the Bible that works for me. And I have a feeling that a lot of you folks do too. And maybe you haven't found it yet. And maybe you don't have the luxury I had of going to seminary and, you know, learning all the stuff from books like Who Wrote the Bible and Who Wrote the New Testament and Misquoting Jesus and a lot of the other really good scholarship that um, I've been able to dig into and learn about some of the more obscure things that created the Bible. And it's also very interesting that, you know, no matter how far down this path I have, I still get confronted by people who are at the far other end of the spectrum. And last weekend, again, I was at drill, okay? And uh, I talked about this in my notes from the minister. Some of you may have read. But uh, I got into a conversation with a young sergeant who wants to become a chaplain. And he asked me a little bit about unity, and my first couple of answers, I think, really disturbed him. So he took me outside and witnessed to me for at least 45 minutes. I think we were pushing an hour. Um, and he said some things. He, first of all, he did say some things. I was like, yeah, you know, we, we agree with that. And then he said some other things that I very silently went, mm, at. But one of the things he said was, well, you've got to take it all or it, none of it's any good. You know, it's either all or nothing. Either you believe it or you don't. And, you know, therein lies maybe one of the biggest things we have to get over. We say in unity that we honor all paths to God, okay? So one of those paths that we honor is the path of my friend, the young sergeant, you know, the, the, the Bible literalist who believes in substitutionary atonement, the whole nine yards. It's a lot easier for us to make peace with the Buddhists than the Baptists. For, isn't it? You know, for, for whatever reason. And, you know, I think it goes back to that thing that Jesus said about dividing families. You know, he said, I, I didn't came to you know, bring peace, I came to bring war, you know, mother against, you know, daughter and, and, and brother against sister and what have you. And that's the way it kind of happens to us. And it kind of pushes our buttons a lot. But he also said something that I think is, is germane to the issue, and that is before you go to take the splinter out of somebody else's eye, take the log out of your own. So the log that we have to take out of our own eye about the Bible is that because we can't believe some of it, we can't believe any of it. 
that it's just a bunch of silliness. You know, either that or we have to let go of our own guilt because we don't. It's like, oh my gosh, that's the word of God and I don't believe. I know better, but I'm going to be in trouble. I just have this lingering feeling of doubt and guilt. Some of us do. You know, we, we just have this, this little thing in the back of our head. And you know, the truth is, I haven't got enough time if I stood here all day to tell you about how the Bible was put together. You know, what I will say is that was the Bible divinely inspired? This entire universe is divinely inspired. Everything in it and about it is part of God. How can it not be divinely inspired? But do people sometimes get in the way? Yeah. Do people sometimes make choices, you know, especially when they're interpreting things or translating things or trying to remember things? Yeah. We were talking in the lobby this morning about that game that we play where, you know, I could say something to Arthur and, you know, he would say it to Taylor and on back and on back and on back. And by the time I got to Joan back there in the back row, it would be a completely different thing that gets said. And so what we have to remember about the Bible is that among other things, it was every story in it was handed down verbally for generations and in some cases for hundreds of years before they were written down. But just very briefly, many people think that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, right? Is that, people heard that? Yes, no? Yeah, some of, some, some of you probably heard that, okay? They're called the Mosaic books sometimes. Well, when we start digging into them, we can actually identify no less than at least four different voices in those first five books. And we label them J, E, P, and D for the Yahwist, the Elohim, the priest, and the Deuteronomist. Sorry. <laughs> You will notice, for example, in reading the creation story in Genesis, that there are actually two creation stories spliced together, and they don't exactly jive. That's what happens when you get a couple different faith traditions who decide to come back together to write one piece of literature, and you get, uh, you know, Bible or Torah by committee. It's like, well, we're going to put in one of yours, we're going to put in one of ours. You know, we're going to tell it your way, we're going to tell it our way. You know, they, they couldn't come together on it, so they told it both ways. Same thing with the story about the flood. If you read carefully, you'll see that there are two different versions of the flood story pieced together. And the same thing happens in the Christian scriptures as well. You know, we take a look at those, and um, we identify in uh, Matthew and Luke for example, not only did they plagiarize from Mark, which was written earlier, and use some of their own stuff, but there was another source that we've never found a copy of, which we refer to as Q. It was a sayings gospel, apparently, because it's all sayings attributed to Jesus. And when we do the work on it, it seems that that's actually some of the earliest stuff there is. We don't have a copy of that. All we can do is, by scholarship, sort of glean it out. So, you know, the good news is, is the Bible contains a lot of different voices. And at least one of those voices may resonate with you. The bad news is, is we're probably not going to be able to convince our friends who are in the more orthodox camp that it wasn't written by, you know, God and uh, copied down by King James and, and printed by Mr. Gutenberg. And that's the end of the story. You know, what I finally got to with my, with my young friend was I simply said, you know what? We're just going to have to agree to disagree. And thank you for witnessing to me. I really appreciate it. It's really an act of love. And I think that if we can learn to take it as that, 
that's going to go a long way for us. But what's really important to us is to be able to figure out a way to take a look at what is there, as crazy as it sounds sometimes, and have it mean something to us. You know, we look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the legend about Lot's wife. Okay, and, and so, you know, kind of, when last we left off, Sodom and Gomorrah were being attacked with nuclear weapons because, not because the people were um, sexually deviant, but because they were bad hosts. So, remember to be nice, okay? The escapees were told, don't look back. But Lot's wife turned back, and the Hebrew scriptures record that she turned into a pillar of salt. Oh, my God. Quick, honey, break one of your mother's fingers off and take it with us so we'll have some salt. Now, a literalist interpretation would be that she was, in fact, punished by God because she did what she was told not to do. She'd look back, so bam, you're a pillar of salt. Okay, well, now there are a couple of other ways we can look at that. One is that the term being turned into a pillar of salt is an idiomatic expression, you know, maybe meaning that she froze, she was unable to move. I've also heard it uh, suggested that that was a term, again, idiomatically interpreted, that meant she had a stroke. I suppose, you know, if, if uh, you watch your town being nuked, you might have a stroke. That's, that's, uh, that's reasonable to assume. But what we have to really take a look at is the underlying meaning. What happens to us when we look back? You know, in another place, much, much later on, in the Christian scriptures, Jesus talks a little bit about that. And again, it's one of those things that you can kind of interpret a little bit too literally. When he says that he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Right? Now, the literalist version, you know, you'd think, here's this guy, he's plowing along, you know, looks back, yells at mom, bam, you don't get in heaven, you looked back, you were plowing, don't look back. Right? But again, it's just another way of essentially teaching the same lesson in a language that the people can understand. Jesus used a lot of agrarian language because that was the culture in which he lived. So the lesson there, once you've actually put your hand to the plow, once you've decided, I'm on a spiritual journey and I'm going to move forward, when you look back, what happens? You know, I know those of us in recovery, um, if you've ever had to deal with looking back on what it was, now you can look back and learn, but if you look back and think, gee, it wasn't so bad back there. That's how people end up relapsing. And we are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to hear this in the way that it's actually spoken. It doesn't mean in a judgmental way, you know, you're no good, you can't go into the kingdom of heaven, you look back, you had regrets, you had doubts. It's really about fitness, like exercising kind of fitness. Have I developed that fitness spiritually that I need to fully know the presence of God in my life? Can I really experience oneness with God when I'm in doubt, regret, temptation for the way things used to be? If I'm looking back, how do I experience all that good? It's not a, you're not going to get into heaven when you die. 
It's a, you haven't built the spiritual muscle to get there right now. And that essentially is the same lesson that the expression, the pillar of salt, meant to those people several hundred years before. Lot's wife wasn't ready to leave behind that place in consciousness that she was. She was stuck. She wasn't able to make the journey. There are so many delightful stories in the Bible. Now, we could get into metaphysical Bible interpretation, and that's a whole nother can of worms. They're really kind of nice. Because you can take a simple story like the story in Acts where the disciples decide who is going to replace Judas, right? You think it's just a bunch of old dudes' names that don't have anything to do with me. But doing the metaphysical interpretation, what I came to discover is that it's more important for me to continue striving to continue reaching on my spiritual journey than it is for me to rest on the laurels that I may have won already. Now, there are several steps between those two places. And at some point, we'll do a, a class on metaphysical Bible interpretation, and you'll see how you can get there. But the real truth is, it doesn't matter that hardly anything in the Bible actually ever happened like it could have been filmed for the 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock news. What matters is that it relates timeless truth to us in ways that we can understand if we can get that log out of our eye, if we can let go of our preconceived notions, and if we can embrace those people who believe differently than we do about it instead of resisting them because it's in that resistance that we lose the ability to see and feel the truth that it contains. And the truth that it contains is Jesus loves us. The universe loves us. And the most important truths we have are to love it back and to love one another as ourselves because the Bible told us so. Thank you.